My name is Jeffrey Dudgeon. I'm a resident of Belfast and a city councillor for the Ulster Unionist Party uh, for a couple of years now and a writer of several books on Roger Casement. Well, it means more to me in terms of Easter Rising than some, to be honest. Uh, I think I'm, my family was uh, a Unionist, or a British family, maybe more than a Unionist family, in, in more in County Tyrone at the time. Um, and it, the psalm didn't penetrate my consciousness. The, their you know, service in the army did, but um, well, I did check out recently who signed the Ulster Covenant from the family, and I discovered my grandmother did, but my grandfather didn't. And two of their children did, and a couple didn't. But one my father was too young. Um, so that was true. The psalm really, I've learned more about the psalm in the last five years than I ever knew previously. Whereas I did know a lot more about the Easter Rising for various reasons. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously I know a lot about it because I've written about it. Well, about the Easter Rising, I suppose it's knowing it is the sort of heartland of nationalist ideology or memory or whatever phrase you want to use. Uh, it's always worth inspecting very closely and uh, working out how and why things happened and explaining, it, well, not just explaining the Rising, but the how it then became a sort of a rush into independence almost in five years, which was totally unexpected, I would say, by most people. And that's, it's a bit like the current issues in Northern Ireland uh, in respect of, there was an event in 1968-69, which took off into, well, instead of five years, 45 years of troubles. And uh, Although, in many ways, I think of the events in Northern Ireland as a late flowering of the same issues, which were postponed for 60, 50 years in, in, the, in the North. Well, obviously, uh, having, knowing that in 1966 there was a commemoration, and by 1968 we had uh, the Civil Rights Movement on the streets, 69 we had the guns out, uh, one worries and wonders and did that the whole thing could be reinvigorated by the current, the way the thing is commemorated, particularly obviously in the south, but to some degree in the north, separately from the state. Um, and uh, I'm not too sure how much the 66 commemorations, how relevant they were to the 68 events. I don't think they were as close as some people might suggest. In Casement's case, his body had been brought back in '65, and there had been a huge turnout. Some say 100,000 uh, went filed past his coffin in the cathedral, uh, and it was a very big event. I think probably as big as the 1916 or the 50th anniversary of the, the next year. So that, and there was a little bit of minor scuffling and skirmishing around the edge of that event from. Uh, Republicans, including one I met, Richard Behel, recently in Kerry. The way it was commemorated in 1966, obviously De Valera was still alive, and uh, there was a huge personal links to the events, which don't aren't around. Well, they aren't direct now. Their families have been brought in, as you know, from very heavily into the 100th anniversary. Um, but the, the question is, does it, did it ride, did it elevate... Republicanism in some way, particularly in the North. And uh, I think what it wasn't really, it wasn't the key because the IRA in 66 was uh, communist, effectively, uh, worker, not worker, the precursors of the Workers' Party were the dominant, largely dominant force, so they wouldn't have let it become too um, 
simple-minded nationalist. So then we, we, we turn to uh, 2016 and how the state has commemorated it. The first thing I would have to say is the amount of money is enormous that they have devoted to it. I think it's 200 million euro. This is the state on the skids, we were told, albeit coming back economically to at a, at a fair pace. But um, it's, I think they were trying to uh, throw money at it to keep everyone happy. And obviously their initial attempts were a bit cack-handed. Uh, but putting Heather Humphreys in charge was a, a magnificent move in a way. Uh, because uh, not that she's going to change anything very much, but she's going to develop the theme of it being more than just the uh, the militarists of 1916 being commemorated, albeit that they were are being commemorated very heavily as uh, people of substance and strength, which they were by and large. And the big question always in my mind is the 16 rebels, and Roy Foster would address it in vivid phases to some degree. Maybe not enough. I mean, why were the 16 rebels an entirely different crew from the 21 guerrillas? Um, and all a bit, they took their, their mood from 16, but they were a different group with a different agenda. And whether they were... I mean, the 16 opened up things. It could never be the same again. I mean, within six months, it's pretty surprising. You learn this more. All the prisoners, most of them were out. So London had completely reversed its attitudes and so, saw the writing on the wall. Um, but in 2016, going back, uh, the money, and I, I was a guy who was concerned or nervous, maybe nervous, it's not my job to be concerned, but uh, introducing the Irish army in the schools uh, was a very definite statement. Well, partly that the Irish army was a legitimate army, which I suppose was quite uh, astute, but also it was um, militarising the militarism in a sense. And I would say, I mean, young people, I mean, I remember at school, but the only thing I remember when I was about seven or eight was the coronation of the Queen, because we were all given a mug and a bar of chocolate, and that stuck in my head. Now, if I had my, I've had thoughts beyond chocolate, I might have said, well, well, it might have made me a monarchist more than I am, I don't know. <laughs> well, the first thing I think it is true to say that the Republicans have made a uh, coherent decision to, uh, to be attached to them in some form, bigger in some cases, and but quite significantly, I noticed there was a centenary dinner at the City Hall, and uh, I'm just trying to think which of the events there have been so many. Um, I'm pretty sure there was a large turnout from Sinn Féin councillors, and normally they send one to a thing that's a bit iffy or British or whatever. But, uh, and the, obviously the whole mood of unionism in the last 10 years has been to incorporate the the involvement of the Irish uh, division, as well as the Ulster, the 16th. And uh, that has changed the mood quite heavily. And a lot of nationalists are more much prouder now of their, of their dead relatives in many cases, wearing medals from the 1418 war at, at events. Uh, you know, you can wear your relatives' medals on one side, left side maybe. Your own on the right, but your deceased relatives on the other. And just the, the very sheer fact of naming the names and realise like three brothers, several sets of brothers, three brothers killed in 16. And I, I went to the city councils, the councils of Northern Ireland have an annual visit to the Thelm, which I went on last year, and it was very to see all the uh, monuments and the gravestones and all that. It was an, in the setting of a very peaceful France and Belgium was it was moving. I was surprised how moved it was. Well I think it was noticed certainly and could hardly not be. Um, 
and just I mean, think she's the only single well, no, she's not the only uh, Protestant TD, but uh, you know, she wasn't just a Southern Protestant; she was a Northern Protestant. Uh, is a Northern Protestant in many ways, cabin near the frontier border job, and um, they're not the assimilated Protestants in a sense. They still retain orangeism to some degree, and uh, I was at a funeral in Monaghan last weekend, and talking to a young man who was complaining about them putting triclers on bonfires in Belfast, saying it's our national flag. I'm a, maybe, well, he wasn't saying he was a unionist, but he was saying, certainly saying he was a Protestant, Southern Protestant, and didn't uh, warm to that. Um, I used the term our flag, I thought it was a very Heather Humphreys sort of... And he was living, living in Port Down actually, even though from, this was all, he came from Monaghan. He had everything, uh, mystery as well, and perhaps the most the initial interest, in the uh, question of the authenticity of the diaries. Well, Bent Game, myself, obviously, I, I read all the books years ago of the time, and uh, I read the diaries for the 1959 publication, and just never, just couldn't. Never thought they were forwards, never couldn't really warm to that theme. But as you know, it um, it re-emerged in the 90s. Since then, the whole forgery thesis has gathered pace and become a significant alternative view, which is, it might have been assumed it, it died away. So that remains an interest. But it's a, Casement had an important role, intellectual role and, and, and political role in the early development of the rebels in 16. He knew most of them. He was working to arm them. And uh, though he had fallen out slightly with Tom Clark over the Redmond Knights getting on the Irish Volunteers Committee. Uh, but he, he has everything in that sense, Casement, so he couldn't not be interested. The Casement family in, in Ballycastle, they've told me, you know, for the first 30, 40 years, it was the treason was the problem. Then for the next 20, 30 years, it was the homosexuality and, and the treason was the problem. But now they've come, I mean, the homosexuality is no longer a problem and the treason can be, uh, you know, in the modern times of reconciliation, you have your view, we have our view, attitude. Uh, it, they've, they've come through. And oddly, you know, the uh, Casement family in Ballycastle contributed to Roger's defence fund on discreetly, which was pretty amazing in a way, uh, considering they had sons at the war who were fixed and could have been killed by virtue of his activities. The fact of Share, sharing this so-called peace process concept of uh, shared memories and shared experience is the theme, uh, sub theme maybe of uh, a lot of a lot of the commemorations. And uh, I mean, there's a certain fakery to it. Uh, it's it's trying to cut, you know, cut. Remove rough edges and get people to understand one another and to recognise that the other person has a point of view, which I'm perfectly happy with. But it can become a bit gushy. Well, there was a war in 1914-18 between Germany and England. Uh, now that hasn't been rough edged out of the way. It's been that's been largely ignored in England. I would say uh, the question of imperialism and conflicting colonial experiences and so on, but um, the Ireland, the different views in Ireland, I mean, if you think that Redmond and Casement hadn't the faintest idea of what the Ulster Protestants were about, they thought, even after the UVF gun running, that they were bluffing. I mean, Casement and various people made speeches about how wonderful it was, that they were arming against their English oppressors and all the rest of it, and we, we can work together. Well, I mean, just proved how daft they were, and, uh, 
and you know the longevity of partition emphasizes that, that they hadn't a clue and they still there's probably a lot of people don't really have a they really accept that the Ulster Protestants have a different uh, diametrically different view of where to go but it's constantly reinforced like Brexit is another reinforcer The Republican commemorations of the Rising in 19, here in Belfast and so on they haven't been very significant. There have been a lot of uh, lampposts, um, professionally done images of the, of the signatories and the executed and so on. Uh, but it hasn't impinged, I don't think, a great deal on, the, on uh, any of the communities or any more than the standard issue. So I don't think it's taken off in that respect in, in the North. Uh, a lot of people would have been reinforced in their views and uh, would have been, uh, could, could not other than be a sense of emotional attachment to the, to the deceased and the struggle. I mean, I've seen quite a lot of the RT coverage and their big costume drama and I mean, there was one on women. Well, the other thing is women in 1916 has been played to death almost. It's, um, it's as if they were the dominant force almost now. And it's happening in Belfast. There, Winifred Carney, who was a secretary to Connolly, who was in the GPO, were, were being asked in City Hall to put up a statue to her. So it's that sort of rather overt uh, political grinding that has come out of it in the north. In the south... It's interesting, I don't know. Um, I think people must have had enough of it by now. But it, it all has it. It, it. People absorb it. And I think there's this great sense of pride in the South. The New Ireland came after the marriage equality referendum. It's We're different, we're modern. This is our past. We're proud of it. I don't think it motivates them yet. Well, it'll be a while before we know how it has affected people. It can't not have. Um, and, but we have another five years or so of commemorations. As you would be aware, I mean, we're going to have a very dull year next year. And uh, 1918 election could be an interesting discussion, discussion point uh, because of um, the complications there. And... It was, in a way, more important, probably, than Easter Rising. And uh, the, it's involved, the Ulster aspect to it is quite interesting because the Redmondites were not disposed of wholesale in, in Ulster um, for various reasons. Um, but as you know, they were disappeared off the map in the south. So then you've got 19, 20, 21, 22 and 23, so you've got a lot yet to come. Well, the Civil War, obviously by definition, scientific should be the more difficult one, uh, most difficult for the U or the South, for Ireland, I should say, the new term for the South. Uh, and how it's dealt with, and maybe just long enough ago to be able to be got over, because Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil are, well, they're both alive and well, and Fianna Fáil is revived, but um, I mean, there's a lot of local hatreds probably as well still surface, but the grand story maybe won't, well, you can still blame the Brits for sending in the, getting Collins to do their dirty work. <laughs> Well, again, I think it would be the TV programmes. Well, those are the things I largely saw uh, for the Easter Rising. And, and there have been a, a raft of them, minor ones. There's a lengthy, very well-made programme on Owen McNeil um, in, I think it was a, a, a Belfast production. Um, I mean, there have been a lot of uh, dramas and dramas. I mean, we know from theatre, it was very important in the early 19th, 20th century, the run-up to 16 and afterwards. There's been no, there's been no great literature of uh, 
the Northern Troubles, which I think there's a good reason for that. But the literature from the Southern experiences in the 16 to 20s is obviously huge and strong and uh, genuine. But it's um, a lot of it is written, like most literature, I suppose, antagonistic or critical of, like of case and so on. And in a, an example in a way is Frank McGuinness's play, Observe Sons of Ulster, who some people have recently complained to me about as being a bit sectarian, which I, I have seen, didn't see the current production, I've seen a couple of times previously, I hadn't quite noticed, I thought it was very empathetic. Uh, and, and maybe took a Donegal Catholic, gay Catholic, to write something that, that could stand the test of time, because he wasn't of it, but, but he was... Uh, empathetic, as I say. Um, but there's been no significant literature came out of the, the Northern Troubles. I think because it was a sort of dirty sectarian war, really, at the end of the day, um, despite the grandiose views of some people. Uh, it was Hibernian more than... Well, it was Bernadette Devon called the IRA armed Hibernians a few years back. Uh, it probably was roughly that, and... Uh, that doesn't make for... Well, somebody could write a good book about it, but um, not, not generated from within.